Welcome to Willoughby United Methodist Church. Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. to take a moment for our online viewing audience. If you're a student or a teacher and you have a backpack or a briefcase, we wanted to take a special opportunity to say a blessing over you before we return to school. We know that there are going to be lots of things stuffed in these backpacks and, and briefcases, whether you're studying at home or um, it virtually or going to school. We know that uh, there are many things that fill these backpacks. And, 
and notebooks. Pencils, pens, protractors, compasses, crayons, rulers, scissors, glue sticks, and so much more. We know that some days that these will be packed, overfilled with stuff, and other days they'll be empty, but every day of th that uh, you're in school will be an opportunity to uh, grow and learn and, and prosper. And so we just wanted to take a moment to uh, pray this prayer over you. And if you have a student and want to reach out to us uh, via our office or through Melissa Cork at, GM at our uh, website, you can uh, receive an, a backpack or briefcase blessing tag. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift to you today both students and teachers as they stand ready to receive your blessing and they commit themselves to study and learning in the school year ahead. We ask your blessing to be upon each one of them. Further, we ask your blessing to be upon the backpacks that the students carry and the briefcases that the teachers uh, carry. They will hold schoolwork from each student and they'll be carried from home to school and back again. And as these students carry these backpacks, may they be reminded of the love and care of this congregation that surrounds each, each of them um, during their school day. We pray for the teachers and administrators in our schools as well. May they also be sustained by your blessing. And may they be reminded that this congregation embraces their call to teaching and learning and surrounds them with love and care as well. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. So we have a tradition here at Willoughby United Methodist Church that the fifth Sunday of every month when that happens in the, throughout the year, we take what we call a noisy collection. It's an opportunity to bring our loose change into the church and make a difference in, in our community. And this week, um, we are dedicating the noisy collection that we will be taking, your loose change, and donating that to the Aruka House. We have already been partners with Tikva House, which is a men's recovery house just around the corner from us. And the good news and the beautiful news is they now have the women's home called the Aruka House up and running. They have their uh, house manager in place, and soon that house will be filled with women on the road to recovery. And so we invite you to bring in your cho loose change so that we can partner with them and help them on their road to recovery and bless them uh, with God's love. Ecclesiastes says this, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, a time to give up, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Today marks the end of a time for us, a time when Jason uh, Cork has been with us and blessed us for the last two years, but it's a, a new season in his life where he is going on to a new position in another church. He will be uh, leaving us today, but he will be in our hearts as we uh, embrace the new season of change for him and for us. I wonder if you would allow me to pray a blessing over him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts and the heart and the leadership that uh, Jason brought to us for this season that we had him. We're grateful for the changes that he help us, helped us uh, initiate, and we, uh, we are saddened to, uh, that we lose him for, for this season. Uh, but we want to bless him for the, the adventure that awaits him in the season that is before him. And we also want to receive your blessing as we are going to be entering into our own new season. 
And so, Lord, may your peace and your wisdom be upon us and upon Jason as he goes into this new season of life. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Last week, we began our new four-week sermon series called Rooted. And if you recall, I asked you last week to keep this verse coming from Psalm 1, verse 3, in the forefront of your mind as we go through this uh, sermon series. This uh, verse says this, A person rooted in their faith shall be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose life does not wither. Whatever they do will prosper. This, the, architect, the, ar, the agricultural imagery is strong with this series. And we'll be talking a lot throughout the series about seeds, soil, and growth. After a seed is planted, what do you expect from it? You expect it to grow, right? That's what we expect. We expect the seed to grow and to ultimately get to a point to grow and bear fruit, to reach its uh, maturity and bear tons of delicious fruit. From seed to soil to water to sunlight, there are numerous agents necessary for a seed to grow into a fruit-bearing plant. We talked last week about how seeds and healthy so- how a seed needs healthy soil to grow. And this week, we're going to talk about the other necessary growth agents in a believer's life to bring the seed of the gospel into full fruit-bearing maturity. When you open the soil, I would ask that, would you open the soil of your heart this morning in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do call on the power of your Holy Spirit to cultivate the soil conditions of our hearts this morning. May we have ears to hear and eyes to see the agents of growth for the soils of our hearts. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips be pleasing to you. Amen. So let's talk about the necessary agents of growth through the lens of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, which says... What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor who waters is anything but only God. God is the one who makes things grow. The man who plants, the man who waters, have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God indeed. It's important to remember today that it's God who makes things grow. The seed matters. The soil matters, the water matters, and the sunlight matters, but ultimately the master architect of growth directs the agents of growth. So let's talk about some of these growth agents today. We must realize that spiritual growth is not done by human hands. 
Throughout 1 Corinthians, we see the early church fighting and quarreling about many different aspects of faith. In fact, it was such a problem that the Apostle Paul addressed it throughout first and second letter, letters to the Corinthians. One of the specific arguments was over which leaders that they were to follow. Should they follow uh, a greater one or over another, one that was more productive or over another? Paul clearly states that these are simply servants of God and that the fighting needed to stop because spiritual growth was not a result of man's work. God who makes thing, it's God who makes things grow. This commentary in Paul's letter was intended to free the readers from an unnecessary comparison and to focus on God's work in their lives. Unfortunately, we continue to argue today, do we not? What is a best path for growth? Which pastor is best? Do you remember the good old days? Or which church is having its, the greatest impact within the conference or district? The list goes on and on. According to Paul, these things have no place. And ultimately, the growth is totally up to God. And if it's up to God, then we must rely on his truth. So one of the most important change agents then is God's truth found in his word. So one of the most powerful important change agents then is God's truth found in in his word. Now I don't know about you but for me one of the most powerful lessons that I've ever come across in scripture in the Bible is is the story about the woman caught caught in adultery. From John chapter 8 we read while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives Early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all people had come to him, and they sat down, and he began to teach to them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. They brought, him, brought her before him, and they were making her stand there before all of them. And they said, Teacher, who, this woman, she was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses... They commanded us to stone a woman such as this. Now, what do you say? They were trying to trap him. So he bent down and started scribbling in the ground. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened, them, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And at once he began to bend, bend over and write on the ground again. When they heard it, they slowly dissipated one by one, dropping their stones instead of throwing them at the woman. Jesus straightened up and said to the woman, Woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has nobody condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. What a powerful story confronting our natural bent um, on, on judging others, isn't it, is it not? It's an eye-opener for me, and, and I'm assuming it's an eye-opener for all of us that calls us to examine our own heart and the so sin that lies within, that calls us to, to stop judging others. If Jesus didn't come to judge, nor should we. Secondly, we must realize that we, we are God's field, coming from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 7 through 9. Isn't it good to know that God is interested in our growth? He, he sees each human heart as a field ready to bear fruit. Verse 9 states that we are God's co-workers in that growth. How can we practically aid God in his work? Isn't that the real question here? Well, we must act with wisdom and immerse ourselves in, in community with others who love Jesus and who are growing themselves. Which means another important aspect of Christ, Christian growth is fellowship with other believers. So on a cold winter night, and I know I shouldn't be talking about cold winter nights here in August, but bear with me for this illustration. On a cold winter's night, a pastor decided to go and visit a, a parishioner that had not been attending church for a while. He knocked at the door and the parishioner was rather surprised to see the pastor, so he invited him in and they went into the living room to sit in front of the fire. 
The pastor and both the parishioner were quiet, just enjoying the warmth of the fire. And then there was a crackle in the fire and an ember had popped off one of the logs and, and fell in the corner of the fireplace. And as it sat there originally, it was glowing red, producing heat. But before too long, because it was beside, its, beside itself, by itself, it began to dim. It began to become less warm. Soon it became black and cold. So the pastor got up without saying a word and grabbed a pair of tongs and picked up that ember and put it back on the fire. And within minutes, that ember started to glow again. Within a few minutes, the pastor decided he was, he was, his time, his stay was, an, was over, so he decided to leave. And as he went to the door and they said their pleasantries, before he left, the parishioner said, I get it, pastor. I'll see you Sunday morning. You see, when we remove ourselves from the fellowship of the community of believers, we can become cold and dark. Our hearts can become cold and dark, much like that ember. Let me use another illustration or to see if I can parallel here uh, the importance of being in community life with other believers. You know, as a parent, I can plead, beg, uh, coerce, demand that my son brushes his teeth, and sometimes it has a little impact on him, but most times I'm fighting tooth and nail. However, if a peer from his youth group happens to say, dude, your breath stinks, when's the last time you brushed your teeth? I guarantee you he'll go home and brush his teeth way beyond the expectations of me or even his dentist. You see, when we're in Christian fellowship, true growth is, it can really happen. Proverbs 27, 17 puts it this way, iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens the wits of another. When we're in true Christian community fellowship together, we find ourselves in one of the most powerful change agents of growth. Why? Because we have the ability to hold and to be held accountable by other believers. So we must dedicate ourselves to reading God's word, spending time with him in prayer, and being in community with each other, which brings us to another growth agent, and that is prayer. There is nothing that distinguishes a Christian, the disciples of Jesus, and the children of God from the rest of the world more than, and more strongly and clearly than prayer. Now, I gotta clarify something here about prayer. I'm talking about personal transformational prayer that becomes a change agent. Not treating God like some cosmic vending machine, asking for a parking space or this or that. The power of transform, transformational uh, prayer starts with asking God a question like this. God, help me see my blind spots. Reveal to me how you want me to serve today. God, put an opportunity before me today to be used by you. I guarantee you, God shows up in those prayers and he, asks, he acts mightily and swiftly in those prayers. Prayer in general different, differentiates us between us and the world. Ian Bounds said it this way, it is the infallible mark and test of being a Christian. Christian people are prayerful. Worldly, worldly people are prayerless. Christians call on the name of God who created the heavens and earth, while worldly people do not call on his name at all. Prayer must be habitual, but so much more than just a habit. It is the expression of the, our relationship to God. It is an outward and upward flow of an inward life originating at its fountain of origin. It is an assertion of the soul's paternity, a claiming of the sonship which links us to the eternal. So I ask you today, how is your prayer life? And last but not least, we must regularly worship. Worship is a growth agent that fosters relationship with God and with each other. Don't you long to be back in the sanctuary? We're recording live today from the sanctuary uh, in preparation for 
next Sunday where we'll, we'll be coming back into the sanctuary to worship together. I know for many of us during this COVID pandemic that there is one thing that our hearts long for and that's to be back into community, back into this beautiful sanctuary, back in worshiping God where we were designed and created to worship together. Jesus pointed us towards an answer in John chapter 4, 23 in defining what worship is. He said, Jesus said, the hour is coming and is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Father, the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must be in spirit and truth. Now I think what the point that the point that Jesus is making here is that when we worship, right worship, good worship, pleasing worship, it depends on the right mental uh, mindset that we have, the grasp that God is is really who He is, that He's all powerful and that He is all love and that He is all truth. And if we worship uh, an idol of our own creation then we're worshiping falsely. We're not worshiping in spirit and truth. So collectively, these things are all very important, but in reality, they only serve to set up the fertile soil of our Christian's heart. Growth comes from God and his exclusive work in our lives. Similar to the part that the farmer plays in growing a, growing a crop, he tills the soil, he plants the seed, he waters the seed, but it's only God that can make the seed grow and come to life and bear much fruit. So when we do what we can to create an environment for growth, then God's work in our lives can take root. Did you happen to notice in 1 Corinthians 3, chapter, or verse 1 and 2, that, that it's in God's field that growth is not an option? There's an expectation, and that expectation is that we would grow and mature in faith. To be stagnant is not an option in God's eyes. And Paul makes this comparison in 1 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2, that milk is for infants and solid food is for the mature. He says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are still not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. In this passage, Paul clearly communicates that each per each Christian starts as an infant in their faith. But there's an expectation to be to cultivate the soil of your heart so that you can become a mature follower of God. Some Christians are comfortable in, in their current relationship or condition to, to God. After preaching a sermon one time, a woman came up to me and says, God loves me just the way I am. To which I replied, and he loves you too much to leave you that way, if you know what I'm saying. It's our responsibility to take the necessary steps in our lives and in others' lives to be agents of change for God, to be agents of change that God intends us to be. Growth, so growth needs the right environment. It almost goes without saying that spiritual growth, like natural growth, needs the right environment. It would be absolutely ridiculous to think that an apple tree could grow in the Sahara Desert without the necessary uh, agents of growth. So why would we think that we would be any different if we continue to immerse ourselves in the things that, that hinder our relationship with God? If we continue to do the behaviors that are sinful, we're, we're not allowing the divine agents of change to transform us. Let us consider the way Paul represents that idea in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up 
in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness, with thankfulness, which is a whole not another topic, but I'm, I have a feeling I'm running late. So let us today be willing to evaluate and scrutinize the environments in which we are trying to grow our Christian hearts. Let us be honest about the things in your life that are not conducive to healthy growth. I wonder if you've ever given much thought to the growth process, if you've really taken the time to think about, after all, the growth of a Christian is, is complex and it involves a variety of different change agents. I wonder. I wonder what you think about today. It is not your responsibility to grow yourself. That's God's responsibility. However, you are responsible for cultivating the, the soil of your heart so that it is conducive to the growth agents that God has provided for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would cultivate the soil in our hearts today. Help us to evaluate the environments that we find ourselves in. If something needs to change so that, we, that you can grow us, help us to make a conscious choice to change it. We ask you, God, to grow us and to give us the encouragement to embrace the growth as it comes. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You may not be where you want to be right now, but by the grace of God, you aren't where you used to be either. We want, you, want to encourage you to trust the process of growth. You are God's field, and it is God who will ultimately work through the agents of transformation to bring about growth within your heart. Philippians 1.6 says this, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So let God's work be, con be a continued work in, in the soil of your heart. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may you have a blessed week. Amen. The Savior Forever I'm free Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all My sin and shame Don't count anymore All praise to
my sin and shame don't count anymore. All praise to the one.